Hi, I'm Xiaomei Huang from the Office of Clinical Pharmacology from FDA. Uh, in the next hour, I will share with you my perspective on the application of pharmacogenomics in drug development, regulatory review, and clinical practice. So let's look at the emerging market outlook. If you look at the five years before 2012, you can see the market is essentially U.S., taking more than 62 percent, higher than Europe, 18 percent, Japan, 9 percent, and other countries. A year later, you see the shift. The U.S. has no more than 50 percent of the market share with the other countries picking up. And the so-called farm emerging countries, such as China, Brazil, India, Russia, they have tremendous increase in the sales with about four to $50 billion. So consistent with the market outlook, the FDA has seen submissions more from uh, countries outside the United States. For some submissions, such as the, uh, this, the uh, development of orphan drug products for rare diseases, the data could be completely from outside the United States. So with that in mind, when we look at the submission, what do we look at? Who the drug is for and what is the dose? And these are the ICH-E5 intrinsic factors and extrinsic factors that we need to consider. So here are the intrinsic factors such as age, race, organ dysfunction, genetics, and extrinsic factors such as the uh, concomitant medication. So which factors are important? It really depends on which drug we're thinking about or what disease or the specific regions where the trials were conducted. And it's important to evaluate uh, those critical factors. And let's take uh, genetics as an example. And I want to use the uh, hepatitis C treatment. If you look at the uh, Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium recommendation for treatment that involve interferon alpha. So in one of the table, they mentioned that the CC genotype for IL-20AB is the favorable genotype where patients are more responsive. And they also have a table indicating uh, different race groups, for example, Asian, if 77% has this favorable genotype as compared to 38% in whites and other, African American 15%, Hispanic 31%. So it is very important when you're studying and the effect of the add-on therapy to the interferon, whether the population is sensitive uh, to the new treatment. So the FDA has a guidance uh, where it discussed because the race and ethnicity would affect response. So the uh, Clinical Pharmacogenetics uh, Implementation Consortium has recently published a guideline for, for HCV when the treatment include the interferon regimen. And there, there is a table showing that the CC genotype uh, is more responsive. And they also had another table showing that the uh, different race groups, different prevalence rates of this favorable gene. So for example, Asian has 77%, higher than Caucasian, 38%, African American, 15%. So if we want to study an add-on therapy, such as the direct acting antivirals, we will need to see which population that you study will have enough sensitivity to see the effect of the add-on therapy. So the FDA has uh, published a guideline and recently mentioned that because race and ethnicity affect response rates to NTHCV treatment, so the ability to ensure sufficient diversity in clinical trial demographics to conduct meaningful analysis of such group is important. So this is about IL-28B genotype. Right now, because of the advancement in this uh, drug development for HCV. Many new treatments, you don't need to use interferon. 
And you can look at this uh, publication that reviewed the direct acting antiviral drug. This was just published in the October issue of Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics, where they also mentioned the HCV genotype is critical. And again, the prevalence is different in different populations. So in this paper, they cited uh, a reference indicating that genotype 1 is more in North America, genotype 2, Asia Pacific, 3, South Asia, and then 4 and 5 in different uh, regions of the world. So again, it's very important when we study the genetics and also considering demographic factors in the anti-HCV treatment. So now let's look at uh, personalized medicine. What have we learned from recent drug development in order to achieve a personalized medicine? So there are several articles published recently to look at the factors that contributed to the success uh, in drug development. So one of them uh, is from AstraZeneca, where they look at 142 products, uh, projects that were active between 2005 and 2010. So they survey uh, the scientists and individuals in the company and asking 200 questions. And what they have concluded, it's very important to have five R, the right target, right tissue, right safety, right patients, and right commercial uh, potential. In addition, it's very important to have a right culture. So you can have uh, enhanced development based on the five right uh, framework and technology. And if you look at them more closely, the right target, right issue, right safety profile, right patient selection, and the right personalized health care strategy, they can all be enhanced with the improved understanding of personalized uh, medicine genetics in particular. So there was another article uh, looked at the uh, more than 800 drug developers where they searched and look at information of more than 7,000 projects that were in development between 2003 and 2011. So they look at the success rate and the likelihood of the FDA approval. When they look at the root cause for suspended program, either at the phase three stage or NDA-BLA stage, they found that efficacy is a very big factor either at phase three or NDA. Safety, uh, it's, it's an important factor at the NDA. So one of the conclusions from the paper is that if clinical trials that target heterogeneous patient population may have lower success rate than trials identifying uh, responders within a population through the use of biomarkers, genetics. So there are many examples of targeted therapy using specific uh, biomarkers or genetic markers. So I just want to review very briefly uh, genomic efforts at the FDA. So starting in 2002, uh, Dr. Lesko and uh, Janet Wilcock have written a white paper indicating our commitment to uh, pharmacogenomics. And then there was a workshop to discuss the safety harbor concept, where the sponsor could share with us voluntarily. So voluntary genomic data submission or voluntary exploratory uh, data submission, where they would not be linked to a regulatory review. Then we have a biomarker qualification program, and we have issued a guidance where I'll discuss a little bit more later, and to integrate the initial information into the regulatory review. You don't really need a safety harbor anymore. And with the PDUFA 5, the Prescription Drug Users Fee Act 5, we actually obtained resources. We have a full-time employee uh, based on PDUFA 5 agreement with industry. And then 
the companion uh, diagnostic is a very important factor, and we have several guidances to do enrichment studies and drug and diagnostic co-approval. So we work very closely with the other center. We are the Center for Drugs. We work closely with Center for Device. So I will be given an example about warfarin genetics. And there are a lot of discussion on, or controversies, on the use of genetics uh, for warfarin therapy. And there is an issue uh, in clinical pharmacotherapeutics where we discuss clinical utility. Warfarin really spurred the question of the utility of genetic test. So we had an editorial about what is clinic, clinical utility and why should we care. And in that issue, Janet Wilcock has discussed clinical utility of diagnostic, and she specifically addressed the question, do we always need gold standard, randomized control study, to show that a diagnostic is, has clinical utility? In addition, uh, Dr. Bob Temple discussed enrichment design of clinical trials, where you can focus on subjects that's more responsive or, in, in theory, will be responding to particular treatment. So let's talk about the case of warfarin. In the last decade, we have seen many uh, research publications about, uh, initially, it's about warfarin, uh, the variability and the dose that were mostly due to age, gender, drugs, body weight, race, diet, and other factors. But with the uh, research uh, that were published, initially with CYP2C9 genotype, and then the past eight years about VCOR C1, many publications supported that if we, the, the variation in CYP2C9 and VCOR C1 could explain another of more than 25% of variability. So the FDA has initially, uh, 2007, labeled that warfarin will, treatment should be affected or the response will be affected by both CYP2C9 and VCOR-C1 genotype. So that spurred a lot of public debates. Uh, initially, there could be papers, so the FDA paper and the a paper from Anticoagulation Forum uh, against the use. Or there are many uh, public debates where at a meeting, and I participated in this specific one, and there are many passionate uh, discussion, either for or against. When I was at the meeting, it's a 50-50 for and against. One of the reasons is researcher will say, well, Genetics is not everything. There are many other factors. How do we incorporate them? Even you know the genotype. So there are many tools available, and one of them that's available is on, on the net, on warfarin dosing, where you could enter the genetic information of CYP2C9 vcor C1, in addition to patient information. And this website will have uh, a suggestion on the initial dose. So the FDA was also participated in many public discussion, including advisory committee meeting. And so in 2009, FDA put in uh, the current thinking at that time into a paper indicating why we think uh, 2C9 genotype, its effect on pharmacokinetics, and VCOR C1 genotype, its effect on pharmacodynamics are as important as all the others. And based on the uh, public comments, we put the information in the labeling. We put a two by two table because of the feedback that it needs to be clear on how to use the information. So the two by two table indicating whether you have a wild type or a poor metabolizer status of 2C9 versus the VCOR C1 genotype, whether it's a sensitive AA type or more resistant GG type. So if an individual has a sensitive uh, VCOR C1 and is a poor metabolizer, the dose could be from 0.5 to 2 milligram. But if you are a resistant type and you also is a wild type uh, 2C9, 
your dose could be 5 to 7 milligram, and that could be 10 times different. So in addition to this, we also mentioned that if the genotypes are known, then you choose the initial dose. But in addition, the timing to reach steady state could be different. So there are additional information in the labeling. So 50 years after warfarin was initially approved, we have modified the labeling of warfarin. So even after it's, it's, uh, this table was put on about four years ago, the uh, public debate continued. So in uh, two years ago, there was an editorial in New England Journal of Medicine about do pharmacogenetics have a role in the dosing of vitamin K antagonists? Because in that paper, there are three randomized controlled trials, and they have inconsistent outcome. Some suggested it has a value, and the other ones not, no value. So in, this, in the next issue, when the FDA announced the first FDA authorization for next ger generation sequencing, and when it discussed that access of data opens door for the transformation of research, clinical care, and patient engagement. This is based on the NGS. And then in the meantime, they commented on the editorial and the three papers and indicating that utility of genom genomic information for drug uh, prescribing must be documented with rigorous evidence. So CEDAR also has a, had a response. And in this paper, it analyzed the three different studies, indicating how the design of the study, the length, the, 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 the patient choice, how they affected the outcome. And so, so it's very interesting read for this and FDA up today, we still have that two by two table in the label. So with the uh, genetic development, uh, FDA has worked to respond to, anticipate, and help drive scientific development in personalized therapeutic and diagnostic. The reason FDA relabeled warfarin is because of the literature and we have received uh, many comments that FDA should relabel. But in 2013, FDA published uh, this paper, Paving the Way for Personalized Medicine, and it indicates that the concept is really not new. What is new is the advances in the wide range of fields from genomics to medical imaging, and so that allow patients to be treated and monitored more precisely. So I want to touch upon the FDA guidance development because of many comments on the initial FDA relabeling or warfarin in order to have consistency in how we relabel uh, different drugs based on literature data that were obtained post-marketing. Uh, we have made a suggestion that perhaps we will have information early on and from early phase clinical studies. So this guidance was published in 2013. In the guidance, there were many examples how genetics can help uh, with the uh, labeling and personalized uh, medicine. In addition, the guidance also talk about where the genetic information will be placed in the labeling. Just saying that, well, this genetic information and the FDA labeling, it's not the same whether you put in indication and usage versus putting in clinical pharmacology, they have very different uh, implications. And I'll have an example to show that. So there are many examples on FDA labeling with uh, pharmacogenetics related information. And I will discuss the uh, abacavir carbamazepine. Those are safety related pharmacogenetic labeling. And then I'll talk about Cetuximab, clopidogrel, the relabeling is related to efficacy. All four, the labeling were done post-marketing. We accumulated enough information and gained confidence to relabel. But now we're also looking at labeling during, uh, on the first time when the drug reached the market. So I'll use uh, chrysotinib as an example.
So uh, five examples. The first one is safety related, a back of ear. This was uh, approved quite a while ago. And this is a so-called gold standard randomized control study where the sponsor compared prospective screening, so you screen patients, and then control study where you do not screen uh, patients. And you see that the uh, the hypersensitivity rate was 3.4, either total population or white population compared to about 8% when you just do a control study. However, because these patients are also taking other HIV therapy, such as efavirenz, uh, nevirapine, and other protease inhibitors, they could also cause hypersensitivity. So here, there is an immunologically confirmed hypersensitivity. When you look at those data, you see no cases in the prospective screening. And in the control case, you still have it. So based on this data, the FDA put in box warning. So a patient with HLA-B5701, this is the prospective screening, they would have hypersensitivity risk. And so FDA recommends to do HLA-B5701 uh, screening before prescribing a back of ear. And if you look at the AUS info I just looked at last week, it uh, still indicated that laboratory testing would reduce the risk of hypersensitivity. And in addition, here, it indicated the test. It's very strong evidence-based. And also, the data are from randomized control trial. But do we need randomized control trial for all pharmacogenetic tests in order to show their clinical utility? So the next example is showing not necessarily. So that's another HLA genotype, but it's a different one. So 10 years ago, uh, Dr. Y.C. Chen studied case studies and found association between Hans Chinese and carbamazepine use. And he found a correlation with HLA-B1502. So FDA looked at these cases along with other cases in the world and put in a box warning. It indicated that the rate is one to six per 10,000 in countries, uh, mainly uh, Caucasians. But it's about 10 times higher uh, for patients with Chinese ancestry. So is that a risk population should be screened for the presence of HLA-B1502. And there was another study in Taiwan where the screening is mandatory. And they published in New England Journal of Medicine once the test was approved and it's mandatory. And they found if the HLA B1502 is positive, they use alternate therapy. Or if they're negative, then continue to prescribe carbamazepine. They show no cases of carbamazepine. So this case showed it's not really randomized gold standard approach, whether we can use control trial practically or ethically. And so next I'll give a few examples on efficacy-based pharmacogenetic testing. So this again is a controversial uh, relabeling from the FDA. So we look at the uh, role of clopidogrel activity of proteins with known genetic polymorphism. So here there are several that are listed. So if you look at pharmacokinetics, you can see a very strong uh, differences in CYP2C19 in the area under the curve of metabolite. And I'll, I'll talk about that in the next slide. Or if you look at pharmacodynamic, again, there shows a strong difference whether you're a pro-metabolizer or with a carrier of a variant allele of CYP2C19. This was part of a study of Presigrel. The sponsor, when they developed Presigrel, they used Clopidogrel 
as an active comparator. So they have this information. And they published in Yungan Journal of Medicine, and it shows that if you have one variant allele, your efficacy will decrease. So if you look at composite of death from cardiovascular causes, myocardial infarction, stroke, you can see much higher than non-carrier. And this corresponds well to another study where they look at CYP2C19 and the level of the metabolite, which is the active metabolite. Clopidogrel is a prodrug. So you, you can see if you're a poor metabolizer, your exposure of uh, active metabolite was reduced. When this study from uh, the investigators studying Pressigrel was published, at the same time, there's a French research group also published a registry study and has very similar outcome. Uh, the only difference is they show that you need to have two of variant alleles in order to show the difference from that study. So the, the FDA relabeled and indicating the importance of CYP2C19. But the discussion continues in the literature whether CYP2C19 is the main driver of efficacy. And so there are many meta-analyses that are conducted. So one of them is here, where it shows the, uh, if you are a poor metabolizer, you can see the risk with the uh, MACE, the major adverse cardiovascular events, are much higher. And similarly, if you are homozygous, or even if you're heterozygous, if you have a carrier, the risk with stent thrombosis also higher. So the FDA has relabeled, and it indicated that tests are available to identify TC19 genotype. And at that time, Presigrel was approved. So FDA put in the labeling to consider alternative treatment for poor metabolizer. And so if 2C19 is key to having efficacy, then it's also important to consider 2C19 inhibitor. So in the warning and, re, uh, and precaution section, it also mentioned that uh, we need to avoid uh, CYP2C19 inhibitors. And in the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, it has much more detailed recommendation than the FDA labeling. So it discussed once you did the genotype and depending on what your genotypes are, either you use standard dose of clopidogrel or use alternate treatment. And they listed out uh, what drugs. Tocacrolol was also approved, so it was in the uh, and their recommendation. This is the uh, recommendation from two years ago. So the examples I have given on efficacy is on clopidogrel. So the next two examples about oncology drug. So I think because of our, our understanding of disease states, now we have, uh, for oncology area, we have moved from uh, histology-driven uh, therapy to targeting oncologic drivers. So if you look at here, you have various uh, histology-driven oncology uh, for lung cancer. But if you look at individual uh, uh, cancer type, for example, squamous cell, you can see about 20%. It's about EGFR-driven. And then the other, you see many other uh, genetic variants, each from 2 to 6%. So how do you do a study efficiently? So about two years ago, uh, there was an announcement about so-called lung map. It's a squamous cell lung cancer master protocol. So it is a type of umbrella trial. So where the patients with squamous cell cancer will be screened using a common platform. And then depending on their genotype, they will be assigned to different treatment groups. So initially, five sponsors were enrolled uh, in this uh, LOM map. And there are many other umbrella tr type uh, trial in process right now. Uh, last year, our center director has, in her uh, report on 2014 achievement, she said, this is very important 
the trial type we should apply to other, in addition to oncology, so that it will be more efficient and patients won't have to go through different trial groups as their time is precious. So they, they once they're screened on the common platform, they could be assigned uh, to different trials. So with that, I'm going to give an example on uh, driver mutation targeted trial. This again is an example of relabeling after the drug has been on the market for a while. So in 2008, um, in an advisory committee meeting, we reviewed uh, data in patients. Uh, this is comparing the overall survival with uh, either patients treated with cetuximab or best supportive care, uh, people with colorectal cancer. And you can see there was no difference. But if you look at uh, patients with wild KRAS type, you can see a significant difference, almost twofold uh, increase in the overall survival. So the FDA has relabeled about the indication is for colorectal cancer, KRAS wild type, and EGFR expressing. In addition, it put in the guidance, uh, put in the labeling that this is based on an FDA approved test. So this is our sister center, Center for Device, when they approve the test. And it also put in a limitation of use. So if you have a RAS mutant type, this is the drug is not indicated. And in one of the section of labeling, it even included information about the FDA approved test. And there's a website where uh, the physicians will be able to uh, find. So the examples that I've given before uh, on labeling, they are all done after marketing. So crizodinib and ALK, this was done when the drug's during development and when it's approved, it is in the labeling. So if you look at the highlights, uh, it says indication and usage is for ALK positive as detected by an FDA approved test. What's important is because the drug is uh, it's very high response rate, I believe 60 to 80 percent. And we want to approve, and any other uh, additional information we could get from post-marketing commitment study. So this, this is what we have in the letter. So to assess the adequacy of the current cutoff. So there is a cutoff on the ALK response. So whether it's, it's adequate, and then also test patients Based on the cutoff, they're negative, whether they will be responsive uh, to this drug. And in the meantime, also look at other biomarkers and their response rate. So this, this can be done uh, post-marketing. So what I have given the five examples, abacavir, carbamazepine, clopidogrel, cetuximab, and crizodinib, they're all one genetic test for one drug, or one factor. What about genetics and drug drug interaction? When you have multiple factors, how do you deal with it in the labeling? So this is one example for Ali Gulstad. It's an um, orphan drug product for a rare disease, Gaucher's disease type 1. And because this drug is a CYP2D6 substrate, it's also a CYP3A substrate. So we have genetic information and drug information in the labeling because it's impossible to study in this rare population. So the, a lot of information we derive based on modeling and simulation. So, uh, and we are able to provide very detailed recommendation, but we still have a limitation. So you look at it here. We say if, if a patient is an ultra rapid metabolizer, there is not sufficient information in the simulation to give um, a recommended dose. And if 2D6 was not determined, then we cannot recommend a dose either. Essentially, you have to do a test and determine uh, the, the patient's uh, genotype. Uh, 
So in the dosing administration, very detailed information. So again, FDA clear tests for CYP2D6. And if you're a poor metabolizer, this is the dose. If you're an extensive metabolizer or intermediate metabolite, that's another dose. So under drug interaction, because patient can still be taking CYP3A inhibitor. So when you consider drug interactions, if you are a poor metabolizer or intermediate metabolizer, taking moderate CYP3A inhibitors are not recommended. And if you are a poor metabolizer taking weak inhibitors, it's not recommended. But if you're an extensive metabolizer, intermediate metabolizer taking a strong or moderate inhibitors, or if you're an extensive metabolizer taking strong or moderate 3A inhibitors, then you just reduce the dose. So here, there, there are specific recommendations. And I mentioned, Many of those recommendations are based on simulation. And this, this is based on uh, physiological-based pharmacokinetic modeling. And I want to mention the application of PPPK has been increasingly used uh, recently. Many of them were based on, uh, were used in drug interaction prediction. But we have seen increasingly used in genetics and the interaction between genetics and drug interactions. So essentially, you look at how intrinsic and extrinsic factors can affect the system, how they affect the enzymes and different tissues. And then this information coupled with the drug-dependent characteristics, how they are metabolized, then you can form, uh, construct a model. And then once you qualify the model, you use that further to assimilate situations where clinical studies are not possible. So next I, I want to mention, in order to realize personalized medicine, uh, Dr. Wilcock has written a commentary for uh, a, an issue in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics that's focused on precision drug development. Her commentary is online uh, last month, where she mentioned that future drug development really depends on powerful computational techniques. And in addition, precision medicine will need to be supported by very accurate, reliable diagnostics. So we have worked very closely with our sister uh, center on the development of relevant, appropriate uh, diagnostic tests. So this is just a, a very helpful a review on approaches to drug and diagnostic code development. It's essentially asking, is the diagnostic patient population clearly defined? If it's not, then you go through benefit-risk evaluation in the whole population. And if it is yes, then you weigh additional factors based on the mechanism of drug interact, of the action of drug, the preclinical, say, efficacy, also the class effect, how the drug behave in the same class, and whether efficacy evaluation is only uh, diagnostic selected in patient. And depending on answer, you go to different uh, route. So FDA has set up many framework, regulatory framework for personalized medicine, and many of these guidances are in development. Uh, they, they should be updated in, in this uh, website. So I already mentioned clinical pharmacogenomic uh, guidance, where we mentioned to collect DNA to facilitate uh, the biomarker development. And the enrichment guidance, which is also out, uh, to discuss different uh, enrichment strategies. Companion diagnostic on the in vitro diagnostic, uh, whether it's needed. Uh, for safe and effective use. And then co-development about the process um, on the use and development of companion uh, in vitro diagnostic. So there are many guidance documents for industry, but also for the FDA staff in order to have consistent review. So the president has discussed the precision medicine initiatives and the use of next generation sequencing. 
So Obama was uh, envisioned that in the future, the specific differences among us, whether their genetics, their environment, or our lifestyle, they should allow us to have specific personal treatment. So we know that most diagnostic texts, including some examples like Vivian, they follow a one test, one disease paradigm. But with the next generation sequence, sequencing, a single test identifies thousands or millions of genetic variants by a single individual. And this is very important to our future of personalized or precision medicine. FDA, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the publication in New England Journal of Medicine and two years ago mentioned our approval of uh, our first uh, next generation sequencer. In addition, the so-called Precision FDA initiative, uh, this is developed as a crowdsourcing, cloud-based platform where we can discuss the necessary standards. So this is an area which the beta test will start at the end of the year. So the community can test, pilot, qualify, uh, and validate uh, their concept to facilitate the use of uh, next generation sequencing. The references are all included here. Before I close, I have two more uh, site, site topic, and this is of interest on varied insurance coverage policies in the United States. Uh, this was based on a paper where they look at uh, the, uh, the test that's covered by insurers up to August 2012. So if you look at the HLA 1502 and 5701 for carbamazepine and a, a, a so we have included that in the drug label. Although we don't have FDA clear tests, the insurance company have uh, covered fully uh, the ones that were tested uh, for th the genetic testing. On the other hand, the, the one that I mentioned, they're more controversial, CYP2C19, CYP2C9, VCOR C1. The FDA has in the labeling, FDA has approved test, but if you look at various uh, insurers, you can see the, uh, it's not consistent among a different insurance company. And understand that if you go to the website for each insurer, you will see the committee, the expert committee, based on their reason, to indicate whether they're covering all, none, or partial. And I believe this policy will change as the information becomes uh, more available. And another example is a site topic. It's about direct-to-consumer uh, test. The FDA recently approved 23andMe on a carrier test. Uh, but this is my uh, personal genome test that I, uh, I started several years ago uh, when I asked for my, my own genetic information. And it's very interesting. It sent me reports on clopidogrel. I would have reduced efficacy if I used the standard therapy. And if, uh, with proton pump inhibitor, um, intermediate uh, efficacy. Caffeine metabolism, which I know I'm a slow metabolizer. And also statin response. It's very interesting to say C report. So when I look into uh, my own report, it's very interesting when they say, if you look at CoQ2, and this me and my family member, says a typical odds of myopathy while on statin therapy. But if you look at another one, and, and they all have references, they look at OATP1B1, then it indicated that I would have uh, substantially increased risks of myopathy. So it, it's really important to have integrated response. So do I have increased myopathy or not? And, and I think this is a, a very important area to address when you have direct-to-consumer report. What is the net outcome? Uh, and then when you have another 
another test that's available, BCRP or others, what would be my risk and what's my overall risk? I think it's, it's very important. So anyway, the summary, I think individual patient doses may need to be adjusted based on patient-specific factors, including genetics. And complex computational tools can aid in determination of the right dose for patients, considering multiple patient factors. And this is most important to simulate uh, when in, in subjects with rare diseases, where many clinical trials are not practical or ethical. And FDA has provided guidance documents, workshop, uh, to discuss the regulatory framework for personalized medicine. The challenges need to be, continue to be addressed in the translation of genetic uh, genomic information to product labeling and clinical practice. And I believe collaboration is key to future success, such as the Precision FDA, where every, the community can discuss uh, together and sharing information. So emerging efforts to modernize drug development. And it's really looking at, in order to achieve safe, effective, and quality of drug products, what are needed, and how we can leverage emerging science in order to uh, improve a personalized medicine initiative. So there are many references, um, and I consult them also day to day uh, in my in, in the review or development of guidance. And here, there's a relatively new CEDAR personalized medicine website where the guidance documents and other information are being shared. And here, there are staff uh, from the Office of Clinical Pharmacology and where we reside in the White Oak campus. And thank you for your attention.